Hello and welcome to Access Chat. I'm delighted that we've got a regular from our community on today, Bianca Prince, who is the Global Head of Accessibility at ING Bank in the Netherlands, but responsible, obviously, globally. So, Bianca, um, we've been chatting for years and you're a regular on Access Chat, but um, please you know, tell us about your role and, and what you're doing within ING to um, spread accessibility throughout the organization. This is a nice one because I was actually figuring it's sort of uh, inventing the wheel, of course, um, like we all did. Uh, but on the other side, uh, we are looking at two approaches at the same time, uh, where we build strategy and policy um, supporting an accessible bank for all, which takes time, especially making sure that it's in all parts of the organization. And at the same time, we just go at flow. Um, projects are coming up, we work on them. Um, and that's how we got, for example, uh, in 2017, we started with an idea to see if it's possible to create an accessible card for, uh, uh, for people with visual disabilities. We did a testing sequence and in the end in two 2020, April this year, we actually launched the card in the Netherlands. And those are the projects, just go and, and see where it happens. Um, so technically, uh, we do follow a strategy, but it's not like it's really uh, completed yet because we're still building and we're still developing also based on the fact that regulatory in Europe is still a bit uh, searching uh, based on the fact that the European Accessibility Act is coming up. Um, you don't know what all the countries are going to do. So it's quite a challenging area currently for us to work in. I can imagine that um, we are all in in these large corporates that we that we work in in our, our day jobs, constantly having to balance the the demands of the now and the projects that are coming in the immediate pipeline against the long term strategic goals. And, and of course, when you're working across multiple countries, trying to horizon scan and understand and process all of the different bits of legislation and um, standards and map that and, and make sense of it for our own organizations. It's a, it's a, it's a tricky role you have. And, and so how, how, do you, um, how do you make it simple enough for your, um, your organization to, to be able to digest what they need to do? What we actually use most of the time is that we, we looked up the five areas we need to really focus on uh, from the European Accessibility Act perspective. The Act is really emphasizing on financial sector. Uh, you need to have uh, accessible uh, uh, payment pages, you need to work on uh, ATMs, you need to work on communications, and those are areas we really need to focus on. We need to make sure that those areas are in scope within the bank. Um, what we also notice is that some countries, for example, uh, Spain, in our case, uh, France, they have more advanced regulation, meaning that they come up with the question, we have, did we have a digital requ accessibility requirements? How can we make this? How can we do this? Can you help us out? So it's two way. In some countries, we have already the question which is there. It's an existing question, it's existing regulation, and in other countries, we are just at the start and there it's more about people who have the will to go for digital accessibility, for example, in the Netherlands. Right, Deborah, Bianca, you had a follow up. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, thank you, Neil. And Bianca, thanks for being such a loyal member of Access Chat for so long. We definitely appreciate that. Uh, we appreciate your comments and stuff during uh, each show. But when, whenever you mentioned, um, and I'm, I'm probably not going to say this correctly, but that you didn't have you know, real rigid rules. You, are, you, have, you have plans and they're unfolding. Um, I, I think that's such an important point because I've talked to many large, you know, global corporations. I've had many conversations, for example, with Neil about how in the world do you really 
get your hands around accessibility when there are so many moving parts, including mergers and acquisitions, you know, bringing on others that all of a sudden um, they have to follow all the rules. But, and I've also hear, hear, heard often here in the States that the accessibility consultants just don't understand the sheer volume of what um, a bank like ING or an ATOS would be doing. And so uh, I think it's interesting that you're, you know, looking at it certainly from the European laws, which makes sense because you've got to be looking at this from your geo footprint. But I, I was just wondering if you and Neil might want to comment on this as well, but how does a really large multinational corporation with all these moving parts really get their hands around this when technology is changing so fast, which I think is one reason why you don't have the solid strict rules because this is so nuanced and it's moving so fast. Now, I, I, think actually, I think actually it goes for, I think actually it goes further. Um, when you look at the difference, uh, and especially from regulation perspective, European mainland uh, accessibility is not really regulated. Um, for example, uh, the European Web Directive has been officially effective for governments since uh, September this year, meaning that it's really late um, compared to the US. And I think from that perspective that we are on a whole different page. Um, you see it happening based on very simple, if you, if you read a report from uh, Return on Disability, and, and if you see the difference in, 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 sustain, as in, in, um, in incomes between us and between the US, that's already where you see that our pace is way off when you look at your pace from the US perspective. Um, we have uh, in Europe, for example, within ING 13 countries with now 13 types of regulations. Some of them do have regulations, other don't. You have regulations on employment, you have like regulations on uh, digital. So for example, the European Web Directive in one country, it applies on the bank, on the other country, it does not apply on the bank, meaning that you have a whole variety of needs and requirements. And I think based on that, it's really important to get the general message out. So from my perspective, when I talk about digital accessibility, I try to get the whole ING in there. And when it comes to local, then it's direct support. So then it's acting on a request in our case, most of the time. Um, but we also can learn, for example, uh, ING Australia. Actually, our people in I IT people in ING, in ING Australia are all trained on digital accessibility. They had a training and they did really well. So from that perspective, that is something you can learn from. Um, and that's also a base of information because what we found is they had, they had from the training bureau they used, they got also guidance and guidelines. Based on the guidelines they got, we were looking in to see, okay, how we can we apply them within ING? And I think the most important one when you look at it from a global perspective, because I think we have an advantage here. If you build from domestic and you have to start a global strategy, that's a challenge because you're focused on local legislation. What we do is we try to collect all the legislation together and get to a sequence where you see, okay, this applies to the whole bank. And for example, Turkey has very in-depth regulation that's where you say, okay, this is up to Turkey. We support them developing their policy. And that's also what we advise for countries. We work towards one strategy. We work towards one guideline. The only thing is make sure that local can differ. It's sort of, it's sort of your baseline. And that's the whole part because you move your baseline up towards accessibility. Yeah, I, I, I tend to agree. We we have a focus on commonality. So so any global policy is without doubt going to be less detailed than a local policy because you're trying to find the common points across all of the countries that you operate in. Yep. Um, we we focus on on key principles rather than 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 too much detail. And what we then do is we reference our local policies 
and our different bits. And, and we have policies and standards and requirements for different bits of the organization. So what they do is they're then sub-references in, in our main policies and procedures so that people know how they cascade downwards. And, and, and like Bianca saying, you know, there are sometimes tremendously detailed uh, requirements in, in certain countries, which would be um, perhaps too onerous to apply to the whole org organization or may conflict with uh, requirements in other countries, in which case we, we can't put them in a global policy because of the fact that, uh, that they'll cause conflict between the global and the local organi organizations. So, so those kind of things we, we omit from the policy and we cross-reference in the local policy. So you have an overarching requirement to do the stuff, an overarching strategic um, statement of, of what your purpose is for that policy and the role requirements for the various different people in the organization, what our expectations are that people will do but then you can't prescribe down to the, the minutest detail. What we, we have to leave that to the, the people in country to be able to know what they're doing the best. What we can do is be aware and collect that information and make sure that we, we try and align that as best as possible. Yeah, and based what what we did now is that technically we don't we don't officially have a policy. We have a we are working on the policy. We're trying to match, make sure that it it fits with all the countries, um, but it also fits within all the risk areas within the banks. So so that's that that's the extra part we have. But what we do use is that the parts from the policy. For example, what do you require for training materials? That's what we said. We set a guideline which we published um, within ING. and said, okay, this if you follow this guideline, you have an accessible training. That's what we want to aim for. Does it always happen? No, it does not always happen yet. Um, and 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 I'm I. That's the part of you reach. Um, is not always is not always to the places where where you wish it would be, but that's also the part of development. And I think from that perspective. Um, building towards policy, it's about connecting all the dots, and you can better do a bit longer on connecting all those dots together, but that have every, everybody on the same page, and make sure you have that standard. Um, instead of rushing a policy and say, okay, we have a policy, and you have to comply with it, and how you do it, that's your problem. And I think that's not the way to go, because that's that's not working. We need, especially in the disability and accessibility space, we need to make sure that people know why it's about, know why it's important. Then it's a lot easier to get people, when the policy is ready and when it's accepted, to work with it and embrace it. Because that's what, in the end, my goal, instead of saying, OK, you do this now, because that's not going to work, then it's going to be a checkbox. Ooh, well said. I know that I, um, one of my clients in the United States, I'm not going to mention which one, but one uh, global brand that we work in the, with in the United States, they did not have a policy. Now, things are different in the United States because of our litigation. I, I acknowledge that. And we have laws, certainly, that require our governments and anybody dealing with our governments to to be accessible. But as far as whether or not corporations, anybody outside our government it should be accessible. Uh, we're still using our legal system to pound that out. I'm, we're, I'm hoping like other Americans that our Department of Justice is going to come out in 2021 or beyond and also hold all of the corporations accountable for it. Uh, and, and once again, things are always interesting in the US, but um, I had one client that I was training to do this. And what I found very interesting was that we were taught, I was training content people, design people, programmers, and they kept saying to me, we know how to do this. Oh yeah, we can. And actually a lot, some of the students were as knowledgeable as me and some of the other instructors um, as knowledgeable or not more knowledgeable. And I was like, okay, well, this is great that y'all know how to do it, but why aren't you doing it? 
And they said, because we feel that if we did it without our company telling us to do it, we're just being sort of a problem. We're like, oh, by the way, shouldn't it also be fully accessible? And you're just adding other, and they said, it's not really a role internally we could do. So I know here in the United States, based on the litigation, it is critical to have a policy so that the team understands the expectations of the corporations, because that's part of the litigation process. So I, I just wanted to point that out because I thought it was so interesting that the many of these technologists, they already knew how to do it, but they did have to wait until their company made it a, more of a priority because they didn't want to be the squeaky wheel. I, you know, and once again, I understand things are different in the States, but uh, I was just wondering if Bianca, you've seen that, or even Neil, if you've seen, seen any of that. Um, and Antonio and you're, you know, I know you're heavily engaged in these conversations as well, but I was just wondering if y'all also seen that. To be honest, um, when I, 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 I'm thinking about it because on the one side, I, I do have people who, um, I do have, we do have, within ING, we have a group of people who are trained, who are internal champions. Uh, they got training, most of them, uh, 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 for example, in the Netherlands via the program, uh, the accessibility program they have at the ING Netherlands. We have a program in Australia. But when I look at general, um, I think most of the people, they are aware of the fact that it's important, but they don't know exactly how to do it. and. There is a development going on because actually we had a round table session yesterday where we found, for example, that uh, the goal was actually now from, from, from wholesale banking that all new components must be accessible. If they're not accessible, then they're not approved. That is something we build on based on the fact that we started with our design pro, the, the design guidelines and say, okay, in the design guidelines, we already said accessibility. And based on that, people start to get, okay, what is this about? And then they start searching and reading and, and doing. But on the other side, when I really look at, if, if you want to get everybody within the organization to know exactly what to do, then training must training is required. Because if I ask, um, uh, we have been working with a university, for example, accessibility is still something you do because you like it. It's not basic standard educational process and i think from that perspective if you want to get to the part where accessibility becomes in right from the start it becomes part in the build i strongly believe in the part where you train everybody but training is one you also need to be able to say okay this is in our guide this is our guideline we want to do this and it really helps because it also gets people to, to interest to do the training and to say, hey, I want to become a champion and I want to learn more about accessibility because I want to know how to make my component accessible. And that's one where you want to go, I guess. Uh, one, of the, one of the areas that uh, interests me is uh, the, uh, the space of a customer experience, particularly in everything that relates with online services. So how do you know? And, with today, with the growing of online services and everyone using those services uh, uh, from home, how do you make sure that that uh, when you are doing marketing, when you are doing sales, you understand that accessibility needs to be part of that? You know, if you are in marketing, accessibility should be a priority for you because you want to reach more users. How do you make sure that people that are at the front line of, uh, of uh, marketing campaigns or creating the experiences for the users to navigate on the site really say, oh, we really need to do this because from the moment that we uh, are able to reach more, more users, uh, we're able to improve the experience of the site. It means more people navigating and more people using our services. And that's something we're still working on within IT. Uh, one of the things I do regularly is I write a we weekly a blog post internally, sharing learnings about possibilities and in it depends. Uh, sometimes it's more about a research read, uh, uh, what is the benefit? Sometimes it's a practical one about how do you create subtitles and why do you create subtitles? What is the difference between subtitles and using sign language, for example? Um, and I think from that perspective, 
um, we made steps. So we moved to the part where um, actually I think most, and it should be all, but I am I'm not 100% sure, videos from ING have subtitles now. Meaning that when it comes to commercials, they have subtitles. Internally, not always. Most of the time they have. But then we also see that uh, the improvements like moving to use Microsoft Stream and the, able, the ability to get captioning also puts people in the perspective of, hey, wait, if I use the captioning, uh, uh, people actually can, can, can follow the video and, and can use this. And that's something um, that then they start looking at it. So when we moved to stream and when I saw captioning was available, I actually shared an article and say, okay, you know what, if you use captioning, make sure that you also check the text because there are things not going well. Um, and, and make sure that everything is clear and, and everything is there because not everybody can listen to your video. That is something uh, um, people need to be aware of. And it really helps when you have people in communications uh, who have a disability themselves. I think that's an important option. Um, but unfortunate, that's still an area where, at least in my experience, I don't see many people with disabilities yet. Um, and, and, and that should be more because then you get to the part where uh, uh, it becomes it becomes part of, how would you say that? Um, it becomes part of the way of working. It becomes part of the way of thinking within a team based on the fact if you have a person in your team who is deaf, um, you, you think differently about communication, about reaching everybody. And I think those are elements which make marketing teams and communications teams much stronger, but also the part of how do you communicate? Uh, what is your message about? Make sure that everybody is included in the message and everybody feels included in the message. Um, based on that, I think the Unilever uh, uh, commercial is very cool on that one because I have people of color, people of disability, people uh, younger age, uh, uh, older you know it's it's all over the it's going all over the place and that's nice because the world is not just about the white average male it's about it's about so many different people uh, 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 from so many backgrounds and different abilities and i think that is that is the strong part if you can do that i think that is sort of the place where we want to come we're not there yet but i think we will get there but we have to give it some time. Yeah, I, I think that that representation, the, the sort of public face and representation is, a, is a, a, a work that a lot of organizations have still got to do more on. Yeah, um, and I think that, that one of the challenges we, we actually have is that unless you've got a budget to go out and hire your own actors and you know people in the communities, the, the imagery that's available is terrible. It, the lack of inclusive stock photos of disabled people and people from different mixed ethnic backgrounds in real working situations is really poor. And even when you pay for it, you're, you're, you're most likely to get representations of disability that are extremely cliched and, um, um, and borderline offensive to the disability community. So, so I think that there's, there's multiple strands to some of this, um, especially for, for sort of, even in large organizations, you know, the marketing budget for a particular project or pro, uh, or product might not be so huge for a, for a communication or whatever. So, so trying to work out how, how to do that, you know, they go on, to pull down some stock photos and you end up with this sort of vanilla pastiche of, of bland paleness and um, lack of represent lack of diversity and representation so I mean one of the things that I, I'm really keen to see is actually better imagery um, you know and and that to be open source as well because actually I, I understand that people need to be paid for stuff 
but equally the, the we're in this kind of vicious cycle at the moment where um, lots of small projects and lots of stuff that happens and gets created is done using free stock and and that's even more limited so so the the need for people to share and give their stock photos and, and and be themselves on social is really important and for also that uh the license to be given to be completely royalty free and allow people to adapt it because the other thing is there are some nice disability inclusive photos but there are ones that have so many restrictions on them that they're unusable in in lots of contexts because you have to leave branding on there and everything else and you know, your, your marketing team are not going to leave someone else's branding on the stuff that they're creating so um i think there's maybe as um organizations that commission some of this stuff what we could do is work together to start creating a, a a library where we donate um the materials to the public to be reused a bit like the bbc has done with with their code repositories uh is is to make it available so that so that we we start to have this resource available for everyone to create good inclusive communications good inclusive imagery because if we're buying one photo at a time it doesn't cost us that much and we and if we donate it then we start building up a, a resource for everyone yeah but i think it's not too bad to say okay you know what if you start a st start a library but also make sure that people who put in their photos there also get paid because I think that's one of the things what I also hear from, from the community themselves is actually that people say, you know, I can make beautiful pictures and I can make stock photos and I can offer them. Um, but the issue is that I get less paid for my pictures with a person with a disability than I would get from a picture with the shiny uh, uh, blonde lady on the high heels. And, and you know, that, that difference. And I think from that perspective, um, we also need to make sure if you do something like that, that the people who are providing the pictures have a reason to provide that pictures. They need to get paid. Um, it's the same thing. I mean, we all want to get paid for what we do. And it also should be the ability to make sure that you can develop. And that's also an important part of representation. Because representation is not just about saying, okay, I do this for free or I, I deliver this for free. It's also about the fact being taken seriously. And there, on the one hand, pay comes in. And if you would say, okay, yeah, for, for organizations uh, uh, with limited incomes or NGOs, and you say, okay, you can use them for free, but businesses pay a small fee for the, for the pictures, that would be great. But if you have strong pictures, and, and especially making sure that the disability community comes in like in, in real representation, you know, not like person in a wheelchair uh, uh, with a, a Red Cross wheelchair, the, the one you get if you break your leg at the hospital, you know, yeah, that, the hospital chocolate. That, those are really bad. And every time I see them passing by, even in newspaper articles, and you see it and it's like, that's not the wheelchair that a regular wheelchair user would have that's the one you get when you break your leg you know and that's not that's not real that's not reality and i think from that perspective to make that reality and to make it valuable we also need to make sure we can market it yeah, um, yeah. So, and so i think I'm that makes against, it stronger as a community so i'm not against people getting equal pay right and equal opportunity to earn money um what i think we need though is a way of of making sure that people get paid up front and that the yeah. but that the stuff is freely available right and and that you don't pay for it at the point of consumption so so quite often where these these things have happened actually what's happened is that people are donating their photos 
and then the stock photo companies are profiting from the disabled stock photos and the individuals aren't getting anything. So it's better that we create a free to use collection that people have been paid for. You know, we you pay a one off fee and then it's made free. Yeah. Then then the other way around where they get a tiny royalty of micro cents per use um, where they may not ever see any real value back from 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 what they've done and, and also the paywall stops people from using it because, because there's lots of things that that people won't use because they have to pay and sometimes it's not even the cost of it that's the barrier it's the inconvenience of having to go through the registration and payment process right i can afford five pounds but i don't want to go through the process of giving someone my email my card details then verifying it on my phone failing to get the verification number right because i'm dyslexic <laughs> locking myself out you know resetting my password on the other thing because now that's called a, a cascading issue so we i'm not going to forget again it. yeah so so it's a it's a mixture of convenience and um and availability to 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 then hopefully get these images much more widely distributed so that everyone can can use them no, I, I, from from that perspective, I totally agree. Because if if I look at the, the we have very good pictures within ING, and and they're realistic, um, they're taken with a couple, and they're really good. From that perspective, um, I was actually really happy uh, when those photos were were made available. But on the other side, it's quite a small stock, and when you do like, for say, uh, 10, 20 presentations in a year. Uh, you have to reuse the same photos often, and 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 that's on the one side. It's like okay, everybody knows the photos, um, so you're going to search further, and and then indeed it the stock is quite small. So from that perspective, I totally agree, and I think it also makes it easier, especially for for marketing teams to say, okay, you know what? If you have the if you have a good stock which is available, and you pay a small fee to take part in that stock, and everybody gets it. Let's say it's 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 a one in a year, once a year fee or something like that. That would make it interesting for businesses. If you get good stock photos, you pay once a year, you pay whatever thousand, two thousand dollars, whatever for, 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 for the pictures. And in that case, you can use it and you, you can use the pictures, but the people who provide the pictures get equal pay. I think that would be a good one. And it would also fit what you see happening. In, in, in current society. I mean, people stand up for their rights. People stand up for equal pay. Those are important. And I think it would fit what's happening in the, in, in, in the wider society. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we're, we're close to the end of our time already. It flies when you're having fun. I mean, what are the, um, I guess, What's the thing you're most excited about for 2021? Because we're only a matter of weeks away. And, 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 and I don't mean getting out and seeing people, but I mean in terms of accessibility for, for ING. Well, ING, that's a good one, because I don't know if you guys actually uh, got that from, from the social media part, but we were in the finals for the Innovation Bootcamp within ING. Uh, we made the final five. We started with over 250 ideas. So, yes. Good one for accessibility, um, and 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 the fun part was uh, we are working on the idea to have an accessibility answer desk. And what we're hoping next year is, because we didn't win it, we lost from the from sustainability. So that's not a real bad thing. Um, if you lose, you lose from sustainability. It's good. Uh, <laughs> We want to save the planet too. So, uh, from that perspective, so um, but we really hope that we can get it in the business and we get countries to apply an accessibility answer desk within ING in 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 in, uh, in their contact centers. Um, next to that, we're also working on other ideas and and really, I hope next year, looking forward, I hope to get to the part where we have more structure. Uh, uh, our strategy is getting more clear. We can communicate it 
widely also within the organization, but it's not just a part of everybody who works on it knows about it, but it's really getting to the next level. Um, and, and I really hope we can get there. Um, on the other side, it's also a challenging market and it, there's a lot of Oh, we just froze there for a second. Security based on COVID. What's going to happen? Uh, when can we vaccinate and all those things in the picture? And we keep the momentum and the projects, projects we have, make sure it's projects which are viable, projects uh, which are attractive and make sure you can make a difference within in my case, within ING, but it also accounts for everybody else. Excellent. Thank you very much, Bianca. Um, obviously, we have to thank uh, a fellow member of the banking community, Barclays Access and Microlink, and also my Cleartext for helping Access Chat stay on air. We are now in our sixth year. Actually, is it six? No, we're in our seventh year because we've been around six years. That's kind of scary. <laughs> I'm getting old. My brain is atrophying. Um, and we really look forward to you joining us on Twitter because I know it will be a lively one. So we'll, we'll see you next week. Have a great weekend, folks. Have a great weekend.